right, here we go. We've had a big rally in Chinese stocks, uh, and I'm very pleased to have a specialist uh, on the topic back on the show. I think you're the only repeat uh, guest, so it tells you how important <laughs> this is or how, how good you are. Uh, Brendan Ahern from Crane Shares. We spoke in June. Uh, you know, <sighs> what a story and how quickly yeah. that changed. Give us the quick rundown, if you don't mind, on this. I've been priming people to get ready for this follow-up, and people are excited. So, you know, just to hear from the from the horse's mouth, I guess, and then we'll go a bit deeper and try to address some of the questions that I've had people already ask me to ask you. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, one hundred percent, you know, great, great to reconnect, Serge, and yeah, you know, hat tip to you and the team for uh, kind of getting a little bit ahead of this. I mean, obviously, one wants to buy low, sell high. Uh, in advance. So, you know, just kudos to you and the team for uh, really, you know, seeing the opportunity before the catalyst really came. And, you know, those catalysts really were uh, very recently where uh, the PBOC uh, back on uh, September the 24th, on Tuesday, September the 24th, kicked off a whole host of interest rate cuts uh, those cuts are somewhat intertwined in terms of the seven-day re reverse repo rate, uh, but the loan prime rate, which is what the mortgage rate is based off with the um, medium-term lending facility, which is kind of an intra-bank lending rate. So a whole host of interest rate cuts, uh, but we also had very explicit support for the real estate sector that uh, real estate's been... Uh, a real headwind to China's economy, but also to domestic consumption due to the very large amount of household wealth invested in real estate. So a whole host of policies in terms of allowing a massive mortgage refinancing in China, eliminating home purchase restrictions in uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, reducing the down payment on first and second homes. So a, just a big effort around real estate to try to raise consumer confidence, raise domestic consumption. And then from the PBOC was very interesting, was a exceedingly explicit mandate to get the stock market, the Shanghai and Shenzhen, the mainland kind of Chinese A shares market where uh, the PBOC governor, Pan Gong Sheng said, we're gonna give uh, brokerage firms, insurance companies and mutual fund families 500 billion RMB, so just over 7 billion US, uh, to basically buy stocks. And we'll give them another 500 billion RMB, another 7 billion if, if that doesn't stabilize the stock market. And then we'll actually give them more if that doesn't work. So just a very, very strong message from the PBOC yeah. on getting the stock market higher. And then We've only really started to touch on some of the fiscal policy in China, which we think will get further articulated over the next several weeks. Some of that requires uh, China's version of Congress, the Politburo, to sign off on. But uh, President Xi and the state council saying uh, on Thursday, following that Tuesday, that they really want to get um, fiscal domestic consumption rising. That was on Thursday the 26th. So. More to come on the fiscal side, but a lot being done on the monetary side out of the gate. And so I guess I guess two 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 quick points on that. You know, you say and I when I read that too, or the, or the translation thereof, my uh, Mandarin is not up to snuff. Um, it reminded me of other central banks when they said something similar. So if you remember Back in the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis, 07, 08, 09, uh, you know, it was too big to fail, which was an, one way of Paulson and the whole team to basically say, you know, whatever it takes. And then, of course, the whatever it takes, literally, was from Mario Draghi and the ECB. So, again, government officials basically saying, you know, just we're going big, right? So question to you, and this is one of the questions that I've been getting a lot is how long is this rally, is, you know, and we're not looking for specific numbers on the K-Web ETF or whatever, but just more sort of the idea, maybe let's start off granularly from, from, from sort of one to 10, one being like, you know, 
you know, whatever, not really any stimulus, 10 being whatever it takes. Where is this in your in your sort of estimation thus far? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, over the next several weeks, we're going to get further articulation on the fiscal yeah. policy. And that that's arguably somewhere between one and a half to three percent of GDP dedicated to raising domestic consumption. So your China has been very conservative, you know, during COVID and subsequently uh, in giving real policy support to the economy. So th we're, we're seeing a, a real a real seismic change uh, coming from the highest level of the Chinese government. So we've, we've gotten the monetary policy bazooka. And I think that it's, it's arguably we're going to get the fiscal monetary policy bazooka articulated. They've already started to give uh, subsidies around auto sales, uh, electric vehicle, hybrid, uh, home appliance uh, trade-ins. Uh, so you're seeing a little touch on on the domestic consumption side, but but it's arguable argued that you know we're going to see a lot more coming over the next several weeks. So so I think that's that's what it, what makes me constructive. And yes, we've had this immense rally, um, but what makes me get more constructive is that over the next several months, quarters, you know, arguably years. So you're going to have more positive economic data coming out that, you know, that, that China just the data will get less bad. And that base effect of, you know, year over year or quarter over quarter, those are going to be going up. And, and it's against the backdrop of very, very low investor positioning. Uh, you know, in, in February of this year, um, MSCI Canada became larger than MSCI China, despite you know China having a GDP nine times bigger. Uh, just earlier, a few weeks ago, you had MSCI India. I mean, you know, for a day, it, it got bigger than MSCI China, even though China's GDP is eighteen trillion, India's three and a half trillion. Literally two weeks ago. Uh, the Bank of America mutual fund, portfolio mutual fund manager survey, the number one most crowded trade was MAG7, followed by short China. Yeah. Um, and so so you had this incredible underinvestment to China. And, and yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing is the fast money reacting. And that can be hedge funds. It can be individuals. But I think mm -hmm. what gets me excited is... The real pools of assets, you know, pension, foundation, endowment, insurance company, globally, that to move that money back in, you got to get the investment committee together, the board of directors, the trustees. You know, to change that super tanker doesn't happen overnight, and and something has changed. So yeah, we're we're, we're pretty concerned. Not to say that there's not going to be pullbacks and corrections along the way. Yeah, one hundred percent, there will be. Uh, but also we're thinking about things between kind of onshore versus offshore China. No, and that's a great point. You know, I mean, there, there's so many, so many different things that I, I would love to just kind of pick out of way. I'm not sure we have all the time necessary for that. But um, one thing that we, I'll quickly share, share this. I'm just showing people, by the way, if you're wondering what this chart is, this is the KWeb ETF uh, crane shares, of course. Uh, where that's your shop, uh, Brandon. And uh, we'll look at the chart a bit more just for perspective. For those people that are just listening into this, this is our second uh, interview with, with Brandon. Very fortunate to have him here, as I said before. Our first one was in June. So that was, I think we published early June of this year, 2024. And there, and I think, Brandon, you sat in the same spot that uh, <laughs> you're sitting in right now. It looks like um, you haven't moved much, have you? No, I'm kidding. I, I, I do um, usually go into New York City. <laughs> you know, I, I do I know, usually I work from in the office. <laughs> I know. This could be your office. Um, no, I think one of the things that we touched on then was um, was was sort of like a, a valuation disconnect between what we you touched on it a little bit. You know, the the Max Seven shiniest object in town. You know, everyone crowded into that, and that's not to say there isn't real value. You know, at least through a longer term lens. But um, uh, but but there is an underinvestment there in China. So I, I I would or I would really encourage everyone to watch that video. We'll make sure to link people to to that first one. You can just go to our YouTube channel, the the Steady Trader uh, uh, YouTube channel, 
and watch it there. But we'll make sure everyone can see that because it's we're trying to make this a sequence of people understand where we're coming from, where you were coming from at that point. And of course, now uh, and we'll do some math here. Just uh, this is not to 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 do any sort of uh, chest pounding. But uh, when we did that interview in June, it was early June. So I think around there. So we're now on KWeb itself up 30 percent. Obviously, there'll be pullbacks. And this is not, again, not a, you know, a victory lap. But, you know, for those people who like to look at charts and just try to build for perspective, because a lot of people do look only at charts, which may not be very helpful either. But there is a lot of potential more upside just from a very simplistic perspective. Look at the step back where we were, you know, so there's more potential upside here. But I want to just touch a little bit more, if, if you don't mind, Brandon, on the asset allocation part. You know, you mentioned and we saw and we see it here, you know, the, the, the quick money crowd, you know, the, the, the out of money YOLO crowd or, or even, you know, professionals that do this, obviously, that are quick enough. They're squeezing things higher. I'm sure domestically in China that they're they're buying hand over fist with those free loans. You know that that you can basically lever up your bets. I mean that's a no brainer as far as I'm concerned. Um, but again, maybe just walk through. You touch on a little bit. Walk through a little bit more what it takes for a big investment management company, a big bank, for them to get to the point of being having been underweight China to go through the investment committee getting approved yada 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 analyzing it for a bunch of time like what if that doesn't happen overnight i think a lot of people don't understand that which is why the number one question we've been getting is hey serge this has run 30 percent in a couple of weeks how much more is there really right it's a time frame question yeah, yeah i mean i think you know something unrelated to china has just been simply that something that we talked about uh back in july so there was just you know, U.S. equities are up over a thousand percent since the global financial crisis, and non-U.S. equities are up. You know, call it three hundred percent. You know, EM's up two fifty. China, uh, at the time, was up about one fifty. So, so you know, a lot of investors have completely given up on diversification because you know, fifteen years is sixty times you open your account statement and say. You know, why am I why, why do I own this non US equities that it does nothing but underperform and and I think what's missed is that that is very true for professional investors that you know if you're a professional investor how do you go back to your board or your trustee or your investment committee 60 times and explain like well you know you know we might be underperforming but we're diversified you know eventually like you're fired and yeah. And, and I think for a lot of professional investors in the U.S., you have this very negative geopolitical media narrative that puts an added element of pressure on holding China. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of investors um, are under a lot of pressure. Like, how do you how do you add more China before this election? I mean, I mean, how, how do you say? Oh, you know, we think we should add more China uh, with, you know, two political candidates who you know, want to outdo themselves bashing China. I, I think that's a real headwind. What's what what investors in the U.S. should note is that's that's a U.S. only problem. You know, you know, you go to the Asia or the Middle East or Latin America and Europe. China is a bigger client than the United States. You know, you go to Switzerland. AstraZeneca, you know, AstraZeneca or Roche or in, in Germany, Volkswagen or, um, you know, in Latin America, you know, you know, who's the number one buyer of Brazilian soybeans or Colombian oil or Chilean lithium and copper? You know, you go to the Middle East, who's their biggest client? It, it's 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 China. And 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 those investors are unencumbered by any sort of negative media narrative. They're unencumbered by any sort of geopolitical. And, and those investors will come back, I think, you know, particularly in Asia, uh, really quickly. And, and U.S. investors, like, you want to, you know, some of those people will be the last to come back uh, because of that geopolitical. And yeah. the rest of the world isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to hesitate. Um, yeah. and, There's a very... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There's a there's a big world outside the United States, and we sometimes forget that because it's it is such a big, you know, country continent that that uh, that at least uh, you and I are in here. But um, but yeah, you know, I think um, I think it gets political real quick, and especially right now, as you say, with the U.S. presidential 
election uh, as we're recording this uh, just uh, 30 some odd days away that 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 scares some people but i mean if i'm going to just quickly go back to the other point you know so these people are underweight china so so kind of like when you look at this when it, when i take a step back i see the chart i see the breakout that's what everyone asks us for they see the stimulus they can kind of get their head around it right that's why i want to touch on they're basically saying whatever it takes which we heard before from Draghi and the ECB, and we heard it before the great financial crisis here, and that kind of got us, or even on quite frankly during COVID. I don't know what the language was during COVID, but I'm sure it was something similar where we threw the kitchen sink at it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so but from an investment committee perspective, right? So if people, let's say someone missed this initial move, and we're not giving advice here, this is just educational, right? Uh, but, but if someone missed this initial move, like just know that there's a ton of big institutional investors who have not participated in this, yeah, right? Yeah. They are just now getting to the point of evaluating whether they should take up. Maybe just touch us, touch if you don't mind touching on that a little bit, not, again, not specific names, but just like the idea of that, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, listen, China's outperformed in Q3 because of September. And, and that was even just because of two <laughs> Three weeks. weeks. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. it's... It, so two weeks. yeah, two weeks. Yeah. So you know, you think about that. You know, pension fund or foundation. You know, they're, they're you know they're going to have a Q three review and be like, wow, like you know, China kind of came back, and uh, you know, we need to monitor. Is this for real? And yeah. you know that. So 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 that that reallocation will take a long time. I mean, and 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 you know, listen, a lot of investors, you know, myself personally included, you know, got burned on the way down and. There'll be some hesitancy. I think you know a lot of the that 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 foreign investor looking at China will look at kind of the you know the proverbial K web companies, the, the the growth stocks. At the same time, an element of what we're seeing is very much geared to mainland China. Uh, so so you know yes, we're definitely seeing on Monday. I mean, you had a billion and a half of net buying of Hong Kong stocks from mainland Chinese, but you're also seeing a lot of this poly, this stock market support toward the Shanghai and Shenzhen. So I'd contrast that with uh, KBA is our MSCI China A ETF. So it's the Shanghai and Shenzhen. And, you know, that's where some element of what the government is trying to do, if you think about it, is, is trying to raise consumer confidence, trying to get people to spend more domestically. But they're actually looking at the stock market as a indicator of animal spirits. And that's where a lot of this, an element of this policy support to the stock market is to the Shanghai and Shenzhen stocks, because that's mm -hmm. not, you know, call it 95% by owned by investors in China. And so they're trying to put a floor in there. So that's where I'd, I'd almost say there's almost two different Chinas. There's an onshore China versus an offshore China, kind of mainland investors versus foreign investors and self-serving, highly biased, a little bit of an asterisk, just kind of KBA versus KWeb. And, and, and that those markets are very independent of one another. There's no overlap in terms of securities. And, and I think they can move very independently from one another um, and that's what's interesting where, you know, China's got this big holiday, uh, but the, already futures are anticipating a really, you know, a 10% move on, um, it would be Tuesday, um, Tuesday yeah, the 8th when the, when the market reopens. So, so, yeah. so it's, you know, you just kind of almost kind of put yourself in these two different buckets and think about how they're going to react. So it'll be yeah. very interesting to watch because I think, the government will be very focused on that Shanghai, Shenzhen, the proverbial KBA market uh, to try to get that up. Yeah. And you already saw, I mean, again, I, we're, we're recording this here in very early October. So by the time, who knows when people watch this, right, it'll be later on. But but we're already seeing as I'm recording this right now, we already saw, saw uh, Hong Kong opened up again. Um, what, today or yeah, I think today. So they already anticipating that entire move for uh, the onshore market. And, and, and that was without the support of this southbound connect money coming out of China into yeah. Hong Kong. That was close. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, so that's basically speculative, right? Basically people yeah. front running that. Um, just to kind of bring people back to something visual, I, I'm just like to go back to charge because people always ask about this stuff. This is Baba, Alibaba. Uh, obviously, this is one of those uh, stocks in KWeb. Uh, 
you're wondering what that green line is. It's 150 uh, week moving average. Um, I know it's overly, overly simplistic, but I mean, what used to be resistance is now no longer resistance, right? What used to be support uh, then became resistance. Maybe now it's going to be support again. So I'm just trying to give people some visuals here to kind of, you know, be uh, be uh, kind of understanding what where, where we're going with all this. But I guess the long and short of it, if, if I'm hearing you right, Brendan, is, is you think this is pretty significant uh, stimulus. Again, we have to wait more on the fiscal side. But um, I think if there's one thing that... Um, that I, at least I see is I just wouldn't want to necessarily be uh, no longer underweight and most definitely not short this kind of stuff when you have this kind of a, a tailwind. Um, your thoughts on that sort of big picture? Yeah, I think, I think you know, our argument has uh, for, you know, for, and we've been, er, you know, trying to be early in, in educating investors on this is, uh, and listen, you've had this incredible U.S. outperformance over the last 15 years uh, partially driven by a very, very strong U.S. dollar, which has been a huge tailwind to U.S. stocks. Um, and so, you know, A, that that can change. You know, it's not that we're against U.S. equities in any shape or form, but just simply that that um, there's some arguments why the dollar should weaken. And just in terms of foreign capital in the U.S. markets, you know, could that cause money to go back. And a lot of the money that particularly from Asia that went out of China, it went into Japan and India. And now you've got, you know, and, and U.S. stocks. And and I would just argue U.S. stocks, you know, maybe you, you've got some dollar depreciation coming, some volatility around the election, bigger deficits, yep. uh, just, you know, you know, late innings in the cycle, high valuations. But Japan, you got a huge headwind uh, with the yen appreciation. Um, in India, you have very, very high valuations, it's very much a retail, retail driven rally. Um, and and why would you not, you know, why would you just take a piece of those profits and put it in cheap China tech? Hmm. You know, you know, we're not advocating you, you sell everything. Uh, you know, definitely not. You know, we're, we're simply saying like, you know, we see these very, very inexpensive companies uh, particularly the companies within K Web who are all buying back stock. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Alibaba. You know, just filed that. You know, in Q three, they bought back two percent of their shares outstanding. They bought back forty four million ADRs. You know, they spent. You know, I think it was about four billion dollars US. Um, and, and now they're and, being given money to buy back their stock by the government. Now, now <laughs> I would say now they can actually get a loan from the PBOC to buy back exactly. Stock. So yeah, a loan that they can't uh, that they can't uh, lose money on, right? Exactly. That's the uh, that's the big deal. I'm just what I did in the meantime while you were uh, dropping all this knowledge. I just made a quick chart of I looked I took the FXI, which is uh, one of the China large cap ETF, and I divided it by the SPY just to give people a visual here if I were to do KWEB versus buy similar picture, right? So we're really, in that sense, just beginning, right? Without advocating, there's a, a giant, you know, a leap here to to only Chinese equity. That's not the point at all. But, you know, I think uh, a diversification portion, uh, you know, to, to, to an asset. I mean, this is what a lot of the, the big asset allocators are doing right now or contemplating or or about to do as, as the way I see it when I talk to people as well. So just quickly to round off your next steps, where do you see? So as I'm, as we're recording this again, we, we were all a bit early last time, but uh, ultimately yeah. dead on uh, right, I guess, in our, in our timing in the big picture. So you see next potentially some fiscal um, and, and what, and, and how does that sort of fit into this picture? I mean, I guess it's not going to get any bearish in that sense. I mean, yeah, I mean, certainly we'll see further articulation on some of the fiscal policies where, again, details have been pretty light. A lot of, um, you know, verbalization or amplification of policy support, but the actual kind of, you know, what is coming, we don't know. Um, again, you know, the rumors are one and a half to three percent of GDP. You know, mm -hmm. some early on support that's been happening to home appliances, uh, which is why JD.com has done so well because they're very focused on appliances, yeah. but also auto, and that includes hybrid electric vehicle as well as internal combustion. But I think there's a lot more that can happen there, as well as just this uh, mortgage refinancing, this putting putting a lot of money back into the proverbial wallets of Chinese households, trying to get real estate prices up to get consumer confidence up. 
Um, so hopefully, yeah, we get some real, we get a real indication of what they want to do. I mean, there's some rumors about uh, them actually doing kind of, you know, quote unquote, helicopter money or free money for very low income people, consumer vouchers in, in mm -hmm. Shanghai. Uh, but again, very, very, very minimal at this juncture. So again, potentially more positive news coming out over the next several weeks. And again, where have we seen that before? We saw that certainly here uh, during the GFC. And then, of course, during COVID, we saw that in Europe. So I guess the lesson here is we don't want to fight the Fed, or in this case, we yeah. don't want to fight the, the PBC, I guess, would be one way of looking at it. You know, it, 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 in, in China, the PBOC is referred to as Big Mama. And <laughs> it's kind of, a, it sounds funny, and it, I mean... Uh, but that whole idea is, you know, you, you, you don't fight big mama because you're, you're going to lose. And, gonna and I, I, I would, you know, caution anyone who wants to, uh, you know, potentially go against this trend, in, you know, in, in at least the short to medium term yeah. um, for that yeah. reason. That makes sense. Wilson, Brendan, great pleasure as always. Let's see how it plays out. Uh, we will be in touch. I'll be bothering you with questions along the way as this all plays out by email. But uh, thank you so much for joining and for all of you guys for listening. Uh, thanks so much. Make sure you do watch our first uh, interview with Brendan that we uh, published in, uh, I guess, I think it was early June of this year of 2024. So a couple of months before all this, this news broke. But uh, in the meantime, thank you, Brendan. And uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks again, Serge.